I'm Ryan O'Dowd, and you're listening to Ryan's Audiobooks on the Issues Magazine YouTube channel. Today I'm continuing with section 4-7 of the Omega Seed by Paolo Soleri. Book 2, An Eschatological Hypothesis. Introduction. Years ago, if asked about the intent of arcology, my standard answer was the definition of a plumbing for society. Such statement was meant to point out the overdue restructuring of the human societal environment in its tangible, indeed physical, context. The logistics of the urban system were collapsing and in their physical breakdown, flesh and psyche were mesmerized. They still are, in fact, more than ever. In pursuing effective responses to this nemesis in residence throughout the urban landscape, it becomes ever more clear that there is nothing which expresses itself in a human, associative, cooperative, compassionate way that has not been originated and nurtured in and by the physical world. That is to say, a plumbing for society is a sine qua non element on the road to the spirit. What was left out in my statement was a specificity about that which would or could or ought to be found beyond the instrumental threshold of the plumbing in for society. There are two main reasons for this void, one subjective, the other objective. The subjective reason is my limited perception and knowledge of the human condition and consequently limited ability to set or suggest normative guidelines to extend the plumbing to the performance. The objective reason is the real and insurmountable barrier between the creational process of becoming and any kind of regulatory governing, supervising, and engineering of such creational process. It's a barrier because the province of engineering and the province of becoming, though both strung on the warp of the real, do not match. They do not match for the same reasons that science and aesthetics do not match. The art of living, that sought-after chimera, and the engineering pursued by the social sciences have as many things in common as an engine has with a minuet. And those things in common are more numerous than a cursory glance might indicate. Significantly, they are both consequences of mental processes. But in the final analysis, the nature of the engine and the nature of the minuet differ. One could venture to say diverge. Left at that, it would appear paradoxical that a good plumbing for society might have anything to contribute to the dance of life. To dispel the paradox is to assert that without the mechanism, any mechanism specific to the phenomenon, there is no dance. This does not rid life of the mortifying fact that, more than often, the most opulent display of machinery fails to generate even the most timid effusion of joy. It is the case of a necessary but not sufficient condition. The piano is not the music, but without the piano there is no piano music. That is to say, music which is unuttered uttered through the necessary instrument called piano. The arcology is the piano, but the design of the arcology is also a musical composition. Therefore, the arcology is machine and minuet in one, and naturally it can be a good or bad or indifferent machine minuet. Where then is the niche of the social engineer? The piano tuner? It has yet to be found because it is difficult to separate the dance of life from the mechanisms of living. Most of that which we have dependent on good engineering, for instance, contentment, really belongs to a far more ambiguous discipline, transcendence. And that is why from plumbing I had to jump into theology, eschatology, in the strong belief that engineering or science must come after the fact, balancing, compensating, throttling, analyzing, systematizing, informing, tuning, but never incarnating. The eschatological hypothesis presented next, as native as it might be, has become mandatory for the definition and conduct of arcology. Without the eschatological hypothesis, or without trust in an eschatological process, the guideline turns out to be fragmentary at best, or pure licensed by higher authority at worst, since it would move into a tunnel with no light at the end. This eschatology is not an attempt after truth, since truth is not. Only true processes are a tautology. But is it that kind of hypothesis which can effectively restore faith in the human condition, because it is a hypothesis that can have great normative force and therefore is a valid model to be kept in one's mind's eye? As far as I can see, the only way to dismiss it is to offer a more normative conjecture. For adherence to this hypothesis, was one can ask science to work out the methodological grid for its denouement. To appease the religious mind, one can suggest that, at worst, the goal would be the cloning of Logos, since the hypothesis does not accept the existence of Logos in toto, but it takes as the normative guideline the attainment that is the creation of it. 
Religiousness is therefore taken as the most serious of all notions and is seen as inseparable from the ecological evolutionary discipline, which automatically anchors it to the question of survival. There is no religiousness without survival, but religiousness transcends survival as any end transcends the means applied to it. Then what is really to be dealt with at the moment within the eschatological hypothesis is a certain amount of plumbing and then a lust for life which has to be illuminated and guided by the eschatological beacon. Between the two are the observational processes of science which alter and set up a posteriori grids of anticipation. Those grids of anticipation eventually become part of the plumbing and the feedback synergy of the whole. But all along, what empowers and signifies is the more or less befitting art of living, which by definition is boundary speaker and a prophecy maker, simulation. Calling prophecy anticipation has the advantage of injecting in the question the full charge of ambiguity and determinateness necessary to keep planning from becoming de deadly deja vu. Man anticipates. He is an anticipatory animal, and his anticipation is colored by its own eschatological hypotheses or the absence of it, a model also. The synopsis of four religious paradigms, eschatologies, is necessarily limited, but hopefully some of the substance is preserved. 1. For the non-eschatological model of the existentialist, anticipation is at best a heroic but ill-fated irrational guide. At worst, it displays a fair capriciousness masquerading as responsibility. 2. For the pantheistic eschatology, the divine is automatically incarnated in the living stuff, and therefore the incarnation machine is always right. 3. For the eschatological model of nirvana, sufferance or joy are illusory, but overcoming them is optional. It is sufficient to separate oneself from the appearances constructed by senses and ego. 4. For the eschatological model of Christianity, there is a fall from grace which demands man's redemption through faith and or deeds to sustain the struggle which will eventually return man into the arms of the Father. It is the God-incarnated Christ who is the anticipatory radiance of all existing divinity of that which will be if man wants it. For the eschatological hypothesis put forth in these papers, none of the preceding grid is fitting. Not the first, where the present is all that there is, and in it are only unconnected moments of elation and sufferance, ultimately meaningless and reaching into nowhere. Not the second, for which all is well, since relative incompleteness is the only sin of a world otherwise fundamentally good-natured and predetermined. Not third, where there is only one unalterable and absolute reality from which life is obscurely separated, but into which it will have to fall in due time, by way of a dole measured out by the sufferance of illusion. Not the fourth, where nirvana is personalized and willed into the Father, for which birth from the Father is both necessity and malediction, and in which denouement is the reconciliation with the Father by the redemptive process of becoming. However, the eschatological hypothesis proposed here sees in existentialism the importance of imminence, the present, and defines it as the achieved and imperfect, if not brutal, fraction of a divinity ultimately belonging to a remote future, which is possible but not inevitable. In pantheism, it sees the justness of a perspective, which makes reverential the sight and the response of the beholder, the sufferance of being transcending into becoming. In considering nirvana, the forcefulness of the condition of being is distinct from the condition of becoming and the otherwise fallacious contention that becoming is illusory, where being is all that there is. In Christianity, there is the powerful anticipatory mechanism of the redemption of the flesh and its resurrectional paradigm. But this eschatological hypothesis is quite distinct from all four above, even though it could be read into the Christian eschatology if the latter could be turned head to toe. The fundamental difference from them is that the hypothesis is critically wedded to the creational evolutionary process for which truth is not discovered but created and in which revelation is not revelation but discovery, invention, or anticipation, the Christian Marxist synthesis. This has a critical bearing on the dignity or indignity of the evolutionary process and its integrity, that is to say, its validity. Uh, for those religions postulating a supreme being to be chased down, thrown, or to sneak out of paradise, nirvana or oneness seems to be the critical act of the consequence of a critical default of life vis-a-vis -vis the supreme being. What is incomprehensible, in fact savagely unloving as well as logically untenable, is the reason behind the generation of imperfection by perfection, of finitude from infinity, etc., 
Can we seriously endorse the idea that to be innocent animals is satisfying to the Father, but to become inquisitive and tormented individuals is an original sin unbearable to the Father? What makes innocence become malice, if not the existence of the seeds of malice in the Father, the causa prima from which innocence cometh? Theologies have traveled a dead-end road, but stubbornness does not break the unbreakable. Fossilization is the nemesis, the regine ultima. The only plausible explanation is that the supreme being is imperfect even though nothing else originally constituted a paragon. But if the supreme being is wanting, then there is no fundamental discrepancy between the hypothesis offered here and those others. My alpha being is absolute but lacking. Creation is the sufferance of the alpha being on its way to, to a transcended nature of itself. Then the return into the father is indeed a flight into sonhood, the creation of omega being by way of becoming. None of the four eschatologies are satisfactory, because for them nothing that life does or does not do really alters the essence of being, be it brains, Jesus, God, Allah, or existence, as a beautiful construct, pantheism, or a deceit, existentialism. Perhaps they are not eschatologies, since they do not propose an ultimate end as much as the originating magnet, existentialism excluded. This introduction is to affirm that the necessary, if not indispensable, prelude to a fully developed archaeological concept is the definition of an eschatological hypothesis. The Genesis It starts with the preoccupation about the problems of moving things and ourselves from here to there, part of city planning. It ends by seeing the matter of moving things from here to there as the mechanics of God-making by way of perceiving knowledge, etc. As the direct consequence of sufficient concentration of things, complexity, etc., bits of information in specific spots and the power to get them, concentration made possible by sufficient reduction of the space-time parameter entering the system, miniaturization. At the ultimate end is the ultra-durational system in which complexity is its paroxysm, and is centered within a non-space, no-time system. Logos. The Eschatological Hypothesis. 1. Is there a need for a cause of prima, or is it sufficient to observe that to be or not to be are the only two possible stations from which anything can originate? 2. Of the two possibilities, being and not being, it is a matter of fact that being, whatever that might be, a figment of being, maybe, is. Non-being is forever a discarded possibility. 3. This choice is by necessity antecedent to, or inclusive of, any interceding divine power, since such divine power would itself be. 4. Therefore, being itself, divine or whatever, is not conditioned or antecedent origination. Being is itself original, the original choice between two alternatives, being and non-being. A third alternative is impossible. 5. Since being is self-same, non-extensive, and undifferentiated, it has to be spaceless and timeless. Not to be self-same would mean to contain becoming. To be dimensional would mean to be surveyable, that is to say, to present more than one self to itself, to be part and be itself. 6. To be of time would mean to be constantly reforming itself, instant after instant, becoming. Since neither space nor time are parameters of being, questions of where being is and how lengthy it has been are meaningless. Being is being, period. 7. For being, there are two possibilities. To become itself, or to be other than itself, to become. Being has chosen to become. What has caused being to alter itself, and by so doing to abandon being in favor of becoming, is a non-answerable question. To say that the transition is the will of being is no answer, since the question then becomes, what is that which we call the will of being? A better explanation might be that as between being and not being, the choice has been being. So as between being and becoming, the choice has been becoming. Is being then a superfluous notion? Perhaps not, since becoming demands a staging point which non-being could not provide. 8. Being has chosen becoming. The choice is tantamount to the beginning of space, where being can deploy its becoming, and the beginning of time, where being can perform its deployment of becoming. 9. Deployment and performance according to a self-constructing discipline, be it logical, statistical, random, erratic, or other, enact the physical universe, mass energy manipulated in space-time. 10. 
for reasons of the law of large numbers and length of the process, unlimited availability of mass energy, space times, within the logical, statistical, random, erratic, or other discipline, a non-logical, non-statistical, non-random, non-erratic process has taken hold. The living phenomenology. The living first originates consciousness within itself, then self-consciousness. 11. Therefore, a statistically inevitable point of departure is the origin of a process, which eventually makes becoming perceive itself and consequently act willfully upon itself. Self-consciousness. 12. One begins to see in sequence that at each bifurcation, the option chosen somehow negates the other. Being negates non-being. Becoming negates being. Will negates fate. Negation is part of transcendence. 13. Since becoming occurs in space and time, self-consciousness is a transformed, transfigured manifestation of a being in the process of becoming through peculiarly organized arrangements, the psychosomatic, social, cultural systems. 14. Given the media of A, mass energy, being which space-time has put into motion, B, space, and C, time, as pervasive, it is plausible or perhaps inevitable that that which is going on sporadically throughout the universe, consciousness, will eventually extend itself and totally pervade the becoming. 15. Therefore, Conscientization, which is now an exception within becoming, the fated cosmos, might be destined, quote-unquote, to become the rule, the totality. 16. Then being which opted for becoming is now opting for conscientization, and through the more of the same rule might progressively dispose of itself totally into consciousness. 17. Totality of consciousness is totality of intellectation, integrity of intent and achievement, integrity. At such point, time and space... The instruments unraveling the knots of being into the evolution of becoming cease. <clears throat> Since coprescence and timelessness are the necessary conditions for totalizing intellection. Logos. 18. Being and Logos, the being of the origin and the being of the end, Alpha being and Omega being, have two things in common. They are both outside of time and outside of space. For them, past and present, here and there, then and now, do not have meaning. Alpha being the father precedes time and space. Omega being the son succeeds time and space. The first is the original media, the second is the final message. 19. If the process evolution of becoming into consciousness is not synchronized with the physical pulsation of the universe, Big Bang Cycle, then the final being is nothing more than the original being, which has transversed time and space, essentially unaltered in its becoming, and has finally re-entered into itself, self-same, unredeemed, unconscious. In this model, instead of creation of Omega being out of Alpha being, there will be the re-entry of fragments of consciousness and their dissolution into the Alpha being through the unjustifiable, that is to say, unatonable becoming. The evolutionary sufferance will have been for naught. Taking granite as the symbol of the matter-energy universe, it might not be a poor allegory to call this eschatology a granite eschatology, since it needs only granite as a starter. It, it is a granite eschatology reaching for the spirit. It is down-to-earth, stern, demanding, unforgiving, unphilanthropic, and merciless, but its denouement is pure radiance love. It is unequivocal and unambiguous in its broad outline, but paradoxical because it is radical. It is truth-maker and not truth-seeker. It is not a spin-off or something, nor does anything spin off it. It encompasses and includes. It is totalizing. It is not fatal, fatally coming about. It is willed. It humbles life to glorify its deeds. The Father glorifies the Son, fathering the Son. It cannot be charitable since it has to be compassionate. It cannot set boundaries to the possible since it anticipates boundless radiance. This eschatology is constructed with the bricks of matter. It is ecological, an ecology which poorly suffers the constriction of the conservations. Landscape, even though at present it has to go along with the slow time bead of organic evolution. The end result of this ecological dynamism, demonism if you will, is self-extinction into the omega being, a fiery being that flowers or forest, fish or fowl, ape or man could not behold and will not since it is beyond them. The offspring of their sufferance is the sun god, the omega seed. This hypothesis offers the possibility of depriving us of a theological model which is closer 
to our notion of a religious creed. The Theological Model 1. The being of the origin is undifferentiated substance. Alpha being is the father. Alpha being is the base for which there is no base or base. 2. The becoming is instinction within alpha being, the father. Distinct entities constitute the pristine becoming. 3. If 10 to the 80th is the number of distinct particles constituting the being at its first step of becoming, then the father is parceled into an Olympian gathering of the same number. 4. Therefore, in hindsight, those 10 to the 80th singularities are the infinitesimal godlets that become triggered out of being when time-space began. 5. Characteristic of those 10 to the 80th godlets is sameness, segregation, determinism, predictability, dumbness, and the outer directness that the totality of 10 to the 80th has on the part 1 over 10 to the 80th. A divine mob, the primeval, ultimate in polytheism, the least divine of all conditions, nirvana, 6. Only in hindsight is becoming directional towards Logos. The original godlets are forced here and there only by statistical mandate to crack their own isolating armor and to look out to the, of themselves. Life originates, therefore, as soon as 10 to the 80th godlets turn out to be 10 to the 80x, where x indicates the number of activated godlets, the associated divinities. Once the process of integration is triggered, directionality is originated. Survival of the fittest at first. 7. Polytheism has thus originated its own nemesis. The tragic sense of life is sufferance of the conflict within the universe, which involves the consumption of alpha being by becoming at the beginning, and then the consumption of becoming by omega being at the end. The consumption by alpha of itself incarnates becoming, and the consumption of becoming incarnates omega. The loss of the father and the unknowability of the son are the components of anguish. Eight. Since what has happened to some of the godlets, the association into more complex divinities, is a fact demonstrated by the evolution of life, is there a teleological reason why the same might not happen for all of them and to all of them? If not, then somewhere in the future there will be the Omega being, the monotheistic god. Nine. The theological model says, then, that what is at work is the creation of the spirit on the bridge of matter, mass, energy, space-time, between being without cognition, alpha, and being as cognition itself, logos, omega. 10. Therefore, the temporal and spatial process of and or upon mass energy is the transfiguration of brute matter, the original being, the Father God, into divine substance, the final radiance of the Omega being, the Son God. 11. The Godfather of Orthodoxy stands for the necessary media, which transubstantiation will see ultimately as the total incarnation or Logos, or more hopefully it stands as an anticipatory blueprint of Logos. 12. In this process, which is consumed within the spatial-temporal domain, there is an incremental degree of grace being incarnated, the imminent practical sun god. 13. Since the transubstantiation of alpha being into omega being is mediated by consciousness intellection, and consciousness is the sufferance of matter becoming spirit, then sufferance is contextual to divinity. Christ. 14. This theological model is proposed by other religions, for instance the Christian theology, but on a reverse sequence. In such reverse sequence, omega being is seated in the place of alpha being, and the becoming which bridges the two becomes a convolution attempting to reintegrate that which corrupted away from the original plenitude. This is a re-entry in the father-mother womb, whole perhaps in some obscure way, but more plausibly tainted and flawed. 15. This re-entry can be seen as the objectification into the eschatological stress of the individual, subjective, dialectic, of reach and withdrawal, experienced in the birth, development, and death process of each individual, ontogenesis. The call of Alpha being is powerful, if not overwhelming, therefore the individual wants to deify Alpha to ensure salvation and resurrection. Alpha is thus made into the loving father or into nirvana. 16. 
But resurrection, salvation will turn out to be unworthy, is not in alpha being, but in omega being, since in alpha being nothing is there to resurrect it, if not an opaque perception of infinite dullness as yet unredeemed by any grace. Omega being is resurrection itself, since all and everything are co-present, co-active with knowledge of all that ever was, time and space are zero. 17. To keep a semantic connection with theological orthodoxy, the Omega Being is the Omega Godson of Alpha being the Godfather, which in the initial step of becoming breaks down into 10 to the 80th godlets of the polytheistic mineral universe. 18. The Christian theology points to the fatherless condition of life, and man in the myth of the virgin birth. Jesus had a mother in the flesh in Mary, and a standby father in the person of Joseph, but truly the Son of God is an apt and in fact powerful symbol of a father-deprived offspring, which is what the eschatological hypothesis proposes. A triangle, then, is made of the mother, the son, and an unlimited but indiscriminate stock of material represented by the physical universe, thus two persons and a media. Feminine and Masculine in the Theological Model 1. A father earth and a mother in the flesh, nurturing the sun god, gives a clear notion of what the outer environment and its elements contribute to the living inner environment of the womb, generating within itself the sun daughter. But the mother acknowledges in the sun the real father of her offspring, since there is no other father but man. Therefore the mother is the lover of her son. And the son acknowledges in the lover mother the receptacle for his semen, the tabernacle for his birth, the crucible for his extinction. The three components form the act of love that makes the son into the lover. The mother becomes a lover through the conceiving and generative act in which the son is both engulfed and given birth. 2. There will be no fairness or splendor in the human family, where this fundamental distinction and specificity of roles is not intrinsically recognized. The taboo of incest is only the teaser or alert system about the dangers and ecstasies of the heterosexual universe. 3. For the male to lose himself in the generating womb, and by the womb to be regenerated, is the double event relived at each encounter. The sun as the sun lover is extinguishing himself and is reborn in that which is not just metaphorically the tabernacle of life. To the support of the mother lover comes in the form of nourishment, etc., the somehow wanton father nature, the miscast godfather of religion. It is therefore inescapable that the fundamental relationship that bonds the female and the male is that of the mother lover and the son lover, with secondary attributes of daughter and father, brother and sister. 4. It is not simply because it is possible that incestuous relationship might go on between father and daughter, and mother and son, that the incest taboo has to be so powerful, but because to sustain the incestuous act is the nature itself of the heterosexual condition, in which one kind, the male, while in his role of son-lover, is quasi-perfunctorily fathering, and the other kind, the female, in the role of mother-lover, becomes the nurturer at whose breast the new life is fed and cared for. But if the fathering is ultimately secondary to the generative process, the loving is primary in its eschatological cogency, and the loving is the loving of the mother level lover for the son lover, because it is in her where the rite of extinction and birth of the male son is celebrated. 5. But while death dust to dust is a return temporal into the alpha media, which comes from the father, the extinction in the womb is an anticipatory enactment of the rebirth of the uh, into the omega being resurrection, which is therefore bathed in the feminine radiance. To reinforce this rebirth is the fathering of an offspring, which is a link and a component of that ultimate being, the Omega being, the Antelechi of life self-incest, which is the final act of the mother lover and the son lover, joined at the last outside of space and beyond time. Thus concludes section 4-7 of The Omega Seed by Paolo Soleri part of an eschatological hypothesis book two tomorrow we will continue with an eschatological hypothesis with section four eight see you then alum